Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. It's December 10th and today we kick off a brand new series on YouTube recounting the John Bonet Ramsey case timeline. Uh, it's basically 24 years ago that these events played out. And uh, it is really a fascinating look at one of the um, sort of granddaddies in high-profile true crime, one of, one of the biggest cases in the world, really. In this episode, we're going to look at, obviously, what happened on December 10th, 1996, and then sort of move forward. But at the same time, it is really very difficult, for example, in the Ramsey case, to choose any particular time any specific time and to move forward from there because the entire labyrinth, the entire time maelstrom of the Ramsey case is so important. And that is something that a lot of investigators miss, is that you can't look at any of the information in the Ramsey case in a vacuum. And when you do that, you won't be able to sort of figure out the case or what actually what happened. So we are going to sort of unravel the labyrinth to some extent in these episodes. If you're interested in the John Bonet Ramsey case, um, you are in good hands because I've written um, more than three trilogies on this case, starting with the Craven Silence trilogy, then the Day After Christmas trilogy, then Black Star over Bethlehem, that's the third trilogy, and then finally Christmas Star, which, which I highly recommend. Before we get started with today's episode, if you haven't uh, subscribed to this channel, please do. You can click on the blue icon at the bottom right of your screen. Otherwise, like, share, leave a comment, and let's get started. So, on December 10th, 1996, 24 years ago today, that was the last time Brian Scott, the landscaper, uh, was at the Ramsey home and also just the last time that he saw John Bonet. And this is quite an important little eyewitness testimony, if you want to call it that. It is uh, just less than, sorry, just more than two weeks before John Bonet's death. So in terms of that, it's it's quite uh, quite relevant in terms of the timeline. And it's also somebody that's not a family member. It's a kind of an independent person. And so this is something that Brian Scott told the author of Perfect Murder, Perfect Town. Lauren Schiller. And, he, and this is, I think, actually from page 204 of that book. Um, Brian Scott talked about the last time that he was at the house and said that that was on December the 10th and uh, he he was adjusting the candy canes along the front walk so it was this guy Brian Scott that actually inserted those fairy tale colorful you know picture perfect Christmas almost like Christmas card color canes leading up to the Ramsey home he was the one responsible and you know there is something fairy taleish about the Ramsey home that gingerbread design that that sort of old fashioned gabling right gives you that sense of um, almost the old America the the good old American fairy tale if I can put it that way and um, also that these people were sort of good, good, um, how can I put it, just sort of um, good folk, right? Um, nice, wealthy, well-to-do, respected, um, you know, American people, American family. And they had a lot to celebrate that year. You know, John had been very successful, and we're going to go through that as well. But basically... Um, Patsy was doing her, her usual pageantry and that included beautifying the outside of the house, making the house stand out, which was originally number 755 15th Street in Boulder, Colorado. That address has since changed. 
And you might not think so, but already we've discovered a lot about this family that is going to have an impact on the case, right? Without even going into a lot of detail, the fact that this family were um, well-respected, prominent, affluent, influential, um, far more influential than the average in Boulder, meant that, you know, would you want to prosecute this family? Would you want to go after them legally in a, in a legally difficult case? Would you want to, um, you know, get rid of the goose laying the golden egg in your small community? And, you know, John Ramsey's business, Access Graphics, employed a lot of people. It was a big company in the small town of Boulder. So where are you going to get the incentive? Where are you going to get the kind of the motivation? Who is going to want to go after these people when they're regarded, when they're well regarded, right? Anyway, coming back to Brian Scott, he basically said that, so he was adjusting the candy canes. He said he saw a blue Chevy Suburban pull up to collect John Bonet while he was there. She was wearing a pair of blue overalls and was being bratty about something. Now, this is something, again, that you wouldn't typically associate with the entire John Bonet legacy, the, the John Bonet saga, is that this little girl could be bratty, that she could have an attitude, that she could be temperamental, whatever it is. And that is one of the key aspects that is missing from commentary about this case, which is what are the dynamics of these, these children? Because this is a case about a child that has died, right? What are the dynamics? And the, the dynamics are that, you know, what, how did she get along with her siblings? How did she get along with her friends? How did she get along with her parents? What kind of parental relationship was going on with this little girl? what issues specific to a, a child were going on with John Bonet and what issues specific to this child were different to the issues of any other child her age, which we, we're going to go into more as we go along the timeline. So according to Brian Scott, the landscaper, she was wearing a pair of blue overalls. She was being bratty about something. He said, I think she might have been giving orders, Scott said. Like, you get in the back, you do this, something like that. And he doesn't say what that was about. He doesn't say, you know, who was she giving orders to? Was she giving orders to the housekeeper? Was she giving orders to another little girl? Was she giving orders to her brother, Burke? We don't know who picked her up. We don't know who was the driver of that blue Chevy Suburban. It would be good to know. Was it a friend of Burke's, you know, was it a, a friend of, was it the mother of a friend of his? Was it Doug Stein's mother? Was it, who was it? And, um, but the, the point is that John Bonnet was already quite precocious. She was used to being the center of attention. She was used to getting her way. And then you can kind of ask the question, could that possibly this, cheeky attitude could that have played a role in her own demise now i'm not not at all saying john bernard deserved what happened to her i'm simply saying could her own personality have triggered some kind of altercation could it have triggered some kind of behavior that led to the events of uh, what happened on the night of Christmas Day, 1996. So a moment later, the car was gone, according to Brian Scott. And that that was the last time that he saw John Bonet. Now, I've actually heard a, a longer version of this, that Brian Scott sort of, you know, had more than one encounter with John Bonet in the garden, right? He worked there that you know he's meeting with her on the 
10th of December, not meeting, but, you know, encountering her on the 10th of December wasn't the only time that he had encountered her. And so what is really interesting is in Perfect Murder, Perfect Town, the book by Lawrence Schiller, and, and this book is one of the most voluminous books on the John Monet Ramsey case. I think it is um, almost 800 pages. It's really like a Bible. Um, Schiller actually opens his account with the landscaper. He, he opens the the narrative with a story and an anecdote. Uh, in fact, a couple of anecdotes from from the landscaper. I'm not going to go through it. You can go and read the book to to find out. But what does stand out on page five? Um, just very early into the, the little narrative is that she, she she said to she shared with the landscaper that she missed her father she said I wish he was around more and then the landscaper asked well where does he go and John Bonet responded well he goes away for a long time and then he asked her do you really miss him and then she said yeah I miss him a lot and she actually started crying and again, what this emphasizes in a very simple but elegant way, given the maelstrom of information ab about the Ramsey case, is this, this immediate sort of perception that you've got a, a little girl, she's living this sort of fairy tale. You know, she, she's really getting an unusual experience as a child. She's sort of dressed up like a princess. She is the center of attention. And yet she's kind of like Princess Diana. There's, there's trouble in paradise. There, there are, something's rotten in Denmark, right? Something, something is eating at her. She's, she's desperately unhappy about a few things. And one of them is that she doesn't see her father very much. And what kind of impact did that have on the dynamics of kind of what happened? You know, when your parents, I'm talking about in a general sense, when your parents aren't around, what impact does that have on you as a child? And I think one of the impacts is anxiety. You, you might not sleep very well. I know when I was a small child, uh, my father's building a, a complex and it, it, it was a very stressful time for the entire family and I would wake up in the morning and he would be at work he would have already left for work and by the time I went to sleep as a small boy he would still be at work and this went on for quite a few weeks and it was kind of a, a sense that he was just working very very hard it was in part to save the family because obviously if things didn't work out, things could have gone pear-shaped. And also to sort of set up the family, if that makes sense. And I, I kind of get the feeling, and maybe it's projection, that John Ramsey was in a similar situation uh, in terms of he was setting up access graphics and you know big things were happening and he was needing to run around a lot to do this. But as a result, um, the children missed their father. And um, that does raise the question, you know, did they feel neglected? Did they feel like they didn't see him as much as they wanted to? And as I say, in, this early, in the first pages of Perfect Murder, Perfect Town, you get it from John Bonet himself saying, I really miss him. You know, he goes away for a long time. I miss him a lot. And she doesn't just say that she starts crying and the landscaper doesn't know what to say. Um, he didn't want to intrude or play counselor. I mean, his job is to look after the garden. He didn't feel it was his place. But imagine if he did say something. Imagine if he did go and perhaps speak to Patsy. Imagine if he did call up John and say, you know, John, I've just spoken to John Bonan, she's crying. Imagine that. So... Instead, he just changed the subject and he started to rake up the leaves. And um, what is interesting is, of, just after crying, John Bonet just quickly started playing in the leaves. Bear in mind, it was uh, at the time of year, I think it was early December 96. 
So this could actually be the same day that it was the last day that he saw her. He was uh, raking up the leaves and she started playing in them. She started sort of jumping in, in the leaves. And then although his heart goes out to her and obviously the gardener is a, quite a sensitive guy, quite perceptive um, and, and compassionate, he that that those feelings change to i won't say scorn but a kind of a feeling of agitation when john benet starts playing in in the leaves that he scooped up and he says she was being kind of bratty that she had a bit of a smart a smart aleck in her you know that she could be cheeky and that is part of her temperament that that she's a girl like a lot of girls her age she's a normal, in some ways, a normal six-year-old girl, um, spontaneous, impulsive, fun-loving, um, naughty, you know, that kind of thing, youthful. And um, anyway, they started playing a game. The, the gardener ran after her. She chased after him. And um, apparently, John Bernay, during all of this, actually dumped out a barrel of leaves that the gardener had collected. So he was sort of scooping the leaves up, collecting them and putting them in a barrel or barrels. And then during this sort of game of tag, John Bonet sort of pushed, intentionally pushed over a barrel to frustrate the gardener. And it was sort of fun for her. And the gardener was understandably frustrated, but it was also kind of fun. It was kind of a game. And um, just to show kind of what a kind of a nice guy the gardener was, the, the landscaper Brian Scott, as a gesture to the little girl, in that evening he left a big pile of leaves, um, I think in the front garden. So not in the middle of the lawn, but sort of to the side for her to play on. So because she been so delighted and had so much fun he purposefully left some leaves out for her to you know a pile of leaves to sort of jump on and then he says that was the last time that he spoke to John Bonet um, and the next thing that he knew about her was this the headline that he sort of read in the newspapers And again, just through this single anecdote, we get so much information, but it's part of a much, much bigger puzzle. So this is just one fragment and one perspective into the Ramsey case. It is what the landscaper saw. It is his experience of John Bonet. And then we need to look at a lot of others. We need to look at how her friends perceived her how her mother's friends perceived her, how her brother perceived her, how her brother's friends perceived her, how her father and, uh, is, uh, her father's friends, and so on and so on and so on. In this series dealing with the timeline, we're not trying to solve what happened to John Bonet Ramsey. I feel like that has already been addressed. Um, I feel like that is well known. If it's not well known to you, you can go and read some books. There's there's a lot of literature out there. You're welcome to read my book, Christmas Star, to get kind of, it's quite a short book as well, to, to get kind of the the basis. But what, we, what we're going to do in this timeline review is get a better sense of the context of what was going on, why what was happening was happening, and also just to kind of contextualize the events that inevitably led to the result that they, they led to on the night of Christmas Day, right? On the 25th of December, late at night. Uh, for those interested on Patreon, I'm, I'm also starting a brand new series, a nine-part series where we're discussing the excellent documentary on Netflix, The Social Dilemma, which deals with the ills, the evils of social media, the existential threat that social media makes to 
us as a society and to individuals. And it's quite timely. Um, the day after I announced this on Patreon, the U.S. government uh, announced that they were actually breaking, that they had plans to um, institute legal actions with a view to breaking up Facebook. So this is very much an important issue and we're going to look at it from the perspective of the documentary but also the Watts case. What do we learn from the the social media consumption of the Watts case by the people inside that story about ourselves and also what are our own experiences with social media and how those harmful to us and to others. You can find that on Patreon. Otherwise, if you haven't subscribed, please do. And I will see you guys again tomorrow for the ongoing timeline review of the John Bonnet Ramsey case. Thank you for listening and I'll see you guys next time.